The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Okay, you are back in the House of Mystery. This is Al Warren, Mr. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> what name will it be today? Oh, Mr. Martino Rose. Volupte is here. <laughs> there we go. Volupte. That's perfect. How you doing, Al? <laughs> well, I'm, you know, wonderful. We were stood up on our other interview, and that was, it was your fault. Yes, it was. Yeah. you got to stop being mean to these people. Yeah, I know. Stop swearing. He must have them. realized that I was going to be doing the interview, and that was yeah, it. Yeah, well, once he realized you were the lead on that show. That was it. He was gone. He was like, I'm not doing this show. You no. don't know who I am. I have a movie <laughs> out. And you're letting that little <laughs> will not do it? <laughs> oh, I'm terrible. Oh, getting it all out. That's okay, right. so uh, here we go. Well, we've got interesting uh, two guests, of course. I call them both horror authors, but I guess we can call them some other things. But uh, we'll get into that later. But uh, So the first guy we've got, we've had before, and um, he's willing to come back, which is kind of strange. <laughs> um but uh, Mr. James G. Carlson, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So how are you doing? I haven't, I haven't seen you in a while. you got you got a couple of pigs, don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, two of them. <laughs> <laughs> how, how are, how, I have to ask, how are pigs to, to, are they like a dog, sort of? Actually, no, I wouldn't compare them to dogs. Um, they're wonderful pets, but I don't advise getting them. Um <laughs> They can be a little destructive, and they need a lot of outdoor time. Oh. They're very stubborn, but they're very smart. <laughs> oh. A skunk, too. Yes, and a skunk. Uh-huh. Yeah, I got <laughs> all kinds of stuff over here. It's, it's a madhouse, really. <laughs> and, and now, and you, you have a wife or a girlfriend, too, don't you? A wife, yes. Well, why? Well, actually, she's the one who insists on getting most of these pets. <laughs> oh. I, I, I'm into it, but... <laughs> wow. Yeah, she collects that's, them. So maybe you're part of her collection. <laughs> I would say that's that's accurate. Yes. I uh, see, see. This is the truth. We're going to hear the real mm. story here. That he's yep. really, you know. Well, you know, Dave can relate. You know, Dave. Dave's Mrs. Martino actually <laughs> takes. He has. He has. He took his wife's name right. So when he got yeah. married, that's true. So. Well, see, I only have a cat. But if my wife hears this episode, we're going to have pigs and a skunk. And all sorts of stuff, I'm sure. Well, you're going to do what you're told, you little bitch. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you That's know, kind of how it works, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you'll get slapped around, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know what's going on over there. A lot of damage. <laughs> it's a good anyway, time. Terrible. Yeah. So, uh, and, and so we've got someone else sitting in today. We've never had him before, but he looks very doable. So, Mr. McCollins, thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. That, that was a good compliment. I'm not sure where to go with it, but I, I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a nice thing to say about someone, right? You know? I, I would think so, yeah. <laughs> well, when I saw the title of your book, I think it was Matt. Uh, no, who was it? Damon that, that sort of mentioned hmm. you. And I thought, well... And and so when I saw the title, I was like, <laughs> I went right back to him and said, are you sure? Have I got the right one? <laughs> I mean, Dick, Dick Wiggler. I, I was like, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> yep, um, yep, he was sure. Wow, yeah, he was. Um, and so uh, what, what's your story? Like, where did you, where did you come from? Uh, well, I was, <laughs> I was hatched. Um, it was, it was very dramatic. Now I, uh, I'm actually, I've been a horror writer for quite a while and Dick Wiggler just was something, I decided to do something a little different this time. Um, I have one of my books published with James and Gloomhouse, um, Vera Malum. So, uh, it's been kind of an inspiration. I just been, whatever weird crap floats around in my head, I've decided, well, we're going to go with it. I thought he said, I was, I, I, I've been a horror writer. I thought he was going to say, I've been a horror before. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're talking about writing here. The other stuff, that's, that's a different interview. I, I guess so. So when I go back to James, I have to say, so what are you doing? Like, so you've got a, him on your publishing label. So who do you, what kind of people are you looking for? Uh, I'm looking for um, weird and uh, entertaining, <laughs> some, 
you know, not the same old stuff, really. Um, I do horror, sci-fi, bizarro, dark fantasy, all that stuff. Um, and also, we now have an imprint for Extreme Bizarro, Gloomhouse Publishing, my main publishing company. The new imprint is called Bastardized Books. And it's an it's, it's a interesting one, for sure. What exactly is that? You're saying things that um, extreme bizarro. So how do I take that? Take it as in um, you take the reality that we all accept and you turn it upside down and make it whatever you want it to be. And the focus, it can be humorous, it can be horrific, but usually the two are intertwined. Do you, but you have to be careful then with today's world i would imagine oh yeah you have to draw some lines absolutely <laughs> i don't know about <laughs> i'd say go for it but i mean I, you, but, but in a way because if you're trying to get humor satire almost with horror i would imagine that you'd have to worry about triggering that's the word isn't it so triggering or upsetting someone with something you do in a book so do you have to draw the limit on how far you can go with humor I usually just use my best judgment. I my newest book with Damon Manx actually is called Hacked in Two. My novella in that book is it's called Red Falls and it's mostly horror but also satire. And it kind of paints uh an absurdist picture of both sides of the the aisle, left and right. Well, you know, and that sounded like a town for me. Um <laughs> Red Falls. <laughs> Red, Red Falls. Yeah, that sounds yeah. like my kind of town. Oh, it's it's a weird. It's it's folk horror. It's based on a trip that my wife and I took to a wine festival in, uh, we call it Pennsylvania. It's way up north in Pennsylvania <laughs> in the sticks. You know, a lot of camo, gun racks, things like that. And we were very much out of our element. Kind of like Deliverance. Yes, more or less. Yeah, it was a very strange experience for sure. A little culture shock there, but we had well, fun, and I lived to, uh, you know, tell the tale in a very fictionalized sense. Do you, do you feel like any sort of responsibility toward that? Like, cause it's kind of, this isn't an imaginary town. It's actually a place you went, and of course, you've made up things, and you kind of changed things and made them, you know, slightly different, I would imagine. Do you sort of ever worry about kind of going, crossing the line of what you <laughs> <laughs> involve with people? Well, I did. Act, yeah. I did, in truth, uh, fictionalize the name of the town. I didn't want to use the real one. Yeah. Because we're only maybe we're only a few hours from there, and um, you know, if we ever do go back, I don't want that to be a um, a thing. Well, give me the name of the town, and I'll make sure they know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you privately uh, after the show. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> uh, well, I want to go and hang out. Like know? I said, they do have gun racks. Like a lot of them. Yeah. It's, it's scary. <laughs> what was kind of the point of, of a story like this? What is it um, you look for when you write a book? Like when you do it, is it do you, do you kind of take a question of something that's happened, like something weird, and kind of ask that question, or do you just start on a character? It varies from story to story. Um, in this case, it was I took that experience that I had with my wife and um, – that town up north, and I just ran with it and made it into something ridiculous. Other times, I'll start with a character that I'm really, you know, I really like, or I'll start with a sentence that I just like the way it's worded. So it's, there's no process as far as where to start. It's, it just pops into my head, and I go with it. It's pretty so, random. Yeah, and and why pick Damon to go as a, as a counter, like to, to write the second part of that book? Well, Damon and I, and Mick also, we were in this, on the same publishing company. And things didn't really go well there, but we all kind of bonded and became friends. And I really, I really liked the way Damon writes. So I was, uh, he and I talked and decided to do a book together. And I said, well, why don't, instead of collaborating, why don't you write a novella and I'll write one and see where it goes. And this is kind of what happened. Instead of collaborating, so is that because you know he can't write? And... <laughs> <laughs> I would say he's an exceptional writer. We we write differently, but we both have a 
appreciation for literary horror, I think. Um, but it just uh, I thought it was better just to, in this case, just to go with um, the ideas we already had and see what happens. And so what if they clashed? What if the ideas didn't work? Like, how do you know? Um, hmm. You know, because you could take a good writer, like you could say, Damon, you're a great writer and like him and, and all this stuff like this and say, okay, let's do this. And you, you do something, he does something and you look at it and you go, oh, this is not going to work. Like, what would you, what would, what, how do you know if it's going to work or not? That's what I'm saying. What, what do you sort of, I'm trying to get into the process of, of how you guys do this. Sure. Uh, well, in this case, what I did was I just trusted him to write a good story and if he had submitted it and I didn't like it, I would have, of course, told him this needs work or I'm not going to take it. But as it turned out, it, it was outstanding. Um, it was metafiction meets apocalyptic horror meets psychological fiction. It was really interesting and uh, a good twist. He's good with those, with the twists. Yeah, he's like twisted sister. He's not going to take it anymore. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> when you do this, do you intentionally hope? that people take away something besides the story itself? Because usually when you get into satire, in a way it's kind of a slap to someone to say, look how silly this looks, you being like this, or this sort of, do you, do you have, is there a point to that? Do you have some sort of hidden story in here? Yeah, I think it's, it kind of pinpoints the, the huge division in America right now and how people have become very intolerant towards each other based on their values and beliefs which I think needs to be pointed out more often and hopefully remedied. Yeah, I think with a lot of it, it's got to be pointed out directly, personally. I think a lot of people tend to uh, do a, say, uh, mention a group and go, oh, they're terrible, you know, like the, and not really specifically say to someone, hey, that's not the way we talk to people or something, you know what I mean? Right, that's very ineffective. Yeah, yeah, because it's just throwing stuff, you know. Instead of saying Fox News sucks, they can say Tucker Carlson sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I say this because he has a personal grudge against me for some reason. So I'm saying that, you know, he sucks. Well, if, <laughs> I'd say to have that person have a grudge on you, good for you. Right. You're doing something right. Exactly. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I'm sort of taking it that way now. I'm sort of starting to feel okay about it, you know. But, oh, yeah. you know, but he's completely disgusted with me. So well, good for you. That's okay. I mean, I'm disgusted with you. <laughs> so yeah. we're on the same. The feeling's the mutual same. there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll end up getting married. Who knows? <laughs> <That'd be laughs> it could happen. Interesting pairing right there. Yeah, well, you know, you see, that's how these things happen. Yeah. You know? <laughs> then, then the murder happens. <laughs> that's right. Yep. Opposites attract, and then the end. <laughs> well, you know, to uh, to write satire, and this is for Mick also. I, I wonder, do, do you feel like you need um, comedic timing uh, to write humorous fiction and satire? Oh yeah, in prose form. Yeah, and I think it depends on just how you're going to approach the satire. But if you're, you know, doing more of a like obvious humor, timing is a big help because I mean, comedy is based on timing in a lot of the in a lot of cases and so it can definitely be one of the big strengths if used correctly when you get to that your book here like dick wiggler um <laughs> <laughs> which is a great title for a uh you know to, to throw it at wish, parties <laughs> i wish i would have thought of it <laughs> i'm never going to think I'm never going to think of a, a title as genius as that. I'm just like, <laughs> this is the pinnacle. It's the peak. You know, Dick Wiggler and other useless superpowers. That it's that's it. That this is where I'm at the top. <laughs> you made it. I am. Yeah, this is it. It's all downhill from here. Uh, so, so what is the idea behind this? Um, you know, some guy w wiggling his his dick. Like, what is this? <laughs> well, actually, his deal, he's, he wiggles other people's dicks, but only slightly with his mind. That's that's kind of the whole premise of useless superpowers. No one in this story has really anything useful, but it is some sort of ability, like outstanding ability nonetheless. And the, the idea, I just wanted to do something ridiculous, and the idea hit me, and I'm like, okay, I can run with this. And just built this narrative of not necessarily useless people, but people with useless abilities just dealing with an 
completely ridiculous situation and how it turns out in the end. Well, why, why that? And I say this, you know, because I, I wiggle a lot of guys, t- <laughs> <laughs> and they've never written a book about me. So I, I, I just sort of I look at this, and I kind of think, well, okay, so you're, you're kind of making a, a joke or a satire. Or this is kind of a – you kind of got just people that can kind of do silly things or things that really aren't important with their – powers as you call them right but but what what's the point of this like what is it that you, are you trying to tell us something yes and no uh initially i just wanted to write something funny and just kind of stupid but i think the underlying message that i wound up saying anyway is you know we get in dumb situations and whether we have the tools to get out of them or not you know if we just do what we whatever it is we can do we can get out of it because it's through the the narrative of the book the situation it just escalates and gets kind of not dumber and dumber but just escalates in a very stupid way and so they gotta you know they have to try and figure it out and that's something i always like to play around with is just people getting in ridiculous situations and then having to somehow come together to get out of it and as far as like the dick wiggling thing it was just, it was one of the first completely useless things I could come up with because you can't even really wiggle anyone's dick well enough to be of any good to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so wh- where would you get an idea like that? Is this something that you practiced? Uh, well, I mean, I am by, so, you know, there have been, have been dicks in the past that have been wiggled, so I won't deny that. <laughs> but I don't know, it was just, my brain is got issues and this was something that just kind of crept out wow well, why would you get into uh, writing <laughs> I gotta get this stuff out somehow <laughs> well no uh, but you yourself I mean oh, okay. um, I mean why like what was it about writing that you thought would do something for you um, I think it's I needed some sort of creative outlet you know I I mean, musician or, well, some people argue I'm not so much a musician as a bassist, but, um, you know, I I like to do different creative things, but writing was the thing that always really spoke to me and I felt more natural doing. And so I did it for years and years before actually getting the, the fortitude to start publishing. And when I started publishing, it opened up, uh, I guess, kind of a venue to where I could share what I can do with people, but also if I've got something to say, you know, I've got a way of saying it too. So it kind of checked off a couple of boxes. Wow. Yeah. It it, it always strikes me as weird if, if you, if, you know, there's usually a reason people like to have something to say or somewhere to go and stuff like that, or they're just these natural writers that can write and they have since they can remember. So, um, do you, do you hope to become something out of this writing? Like where did you, where do you see yourself in ten years? Um, chances are probably doing kind of the same thing. I really like. I'll admit I embrace being more of an indie writer now. Obviously, I you know more exposure, more sales. You know, kind of rising up and, and getting more onto more bookshelves, I guess. But you know, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to be, like, multi-million dollar, or like, you know, big stuff. And that, that's fine. As long as I can still write what I want to write and people enjoy what it is I'm writing, I'm happy. I, you know, I, I like keeping, keeping my expectations fairly simple and pushing myself kind of based on that. Yeah, because you, you, you do have to give up a certain amount in order to become that, that star. Yeah. You know, like the class proved that, you know, the anti Beatlemania and they built their their time off of being opposite of what these stars were and they became the stars themselves. Oh yeah, yeah. And I think right. a lot of honesty goes a long way with you know, the public and when they consume whatever entertainment, whether it's the clash or writers or whatever, if you come at it honestly and just trying to put out the best way you can, people respond. 
Well, you know, and then we've got James here. James, he's 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 one of those stars. So oh yeah, um, oh yeah, and, <laughs> hardly. Right. Oh no, you're 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 you've got it going on here. Um, I, when I look at this, so what what made you decide to get into the publishing side of, of books? Oh well, um, I, that goes back to um, the situation I had with uh, Damon and Mick. We were all in the same publisher. And they weren't really doing well by us. So Damon and I sat down and had a talk, decided we're going to open our own indie publishing companies. And, you know, we'll keep it small, but release things that we like. And so far, it's worked out really well. And really, all all the profits from my books go towards Gloomhouse Publishing and our imprint. So that's how much I believe in it. And, you know, Mick's writing is phenomenal. I read Dick Wiggler. It's hilarious and weird. Which is yeah. all I ever wanted for in life. Right. And I, I totally says, recommend it. Says the man with a skunk and a pig. <laughs> <laughs> as much as that can be trusted. Yeah. Well, you know, you're looking for it. You got it. Um, well, that, that's, that's very nice um, to say. But, you know, what is it that you look for in writing? Or what is it you find is good writing? Is it the story itself, or is it the literary part of it? Is it the way people, you know, um, punctuate, I guess, or line edit their stuff? I think each writer brings something different to the table. Sometimes you have wonderful writing, but a story that needs some work. And, you know, we we offer editing, too. So, you know, I'll make suggestions as far as that's concerned. But usually it's just if the story's entertaining and it either makes me laugh or feel something, whatever the case may be. If if it speaks to me, I want to release it. That's it's as simple as that, really. Well, what what is it that the small publishers were not doing or doing badly for you guys, do you think? You don't have to name them, but what is it that you think people should look no. for in a in a in a publisher then? Like what is it that you found missing? What I tell people regularly is if you're going to go with a publisher research that publisher extensively contact their authors and ask if they're happy there Um, in our case we had a publisher that was established and they were they were doing okay but the fact was um, we had to beg for our royalties when we ordered author copies of our books we either didn't receive them or received a fraction of the order and this kept getting worse and worse until um, a bunch of us jumped ship and went in different directions. So it's basically a matter of integrity when it comes down to it. How much promotion do you do as a publisher? Uh, as much as the budget allows. Usually it's mostly social media. Um, I'll make up all kinds of uh, images and post them around social media. Occasionally I'll take out an ad. But indie publishers, you know, we don't have a whole lot of money to work with. So, but I do as much as I can, for sure. Well, sell one of the pigs. <laughs> <laughs> well, no one's going to take those. <laughs> My <rest>. wife will. <laughs> yeah, but I'll, I'll make sure. Yeah, I'll, yeah, let's talk. I'll send you her, uh, her information and then just no, go to no. her. Skip Dave, go to her. Forget I mentioned it. <laughs> and then it'll just happen. He'll just come home and there'll be a home full of pigs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it that would, would be, be something. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start putting him on YouTube. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's that. <laughs> Can't do TikTok. Stay away from that. Um, well, anyway, so um, so what's next then for James? Like, where's where's James going to go you, after this? Hackton two um, is is kind of dying down. What comes up next? Well, I'm working on another split. Uh, this time with an author named uh, Terry Miller. And he's really a really talented author. We're doing dark fiction. My main story in that one is kind of like Edgar Allan Poe meets Twilight Zone. So I'm pretty excited about it. What What is your process? Like, do you, do, are, are you the guy that sits down by, you know, like 10 to 2 and just can sit and write and can plan any time and do it any time or... Do you have to be in a mood? Do you have to have like candles burning and and incense or like what what's your process? My process is pretty simple. Um 
but I do treat it as a job in the sense that I wake up every morning, and once I feed all the animals, including the pigs, I um, <laughs> I thought you were going to say including the wife. No. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh God. Uh, I'm terrible. I'm awful. <laughs> One of my functions here in the household. <laughs> but it's usually around 5 a.m. And I will uh, I'll, I'll feed all the animals, and then I'll sit down and write for usually about six and six or seven hours, if I can. So the mood doesn't affect you. Like, so if you get up and it's just a really bad day, or if the weather's crappy, or if there's something, you know, the pigs got diarrhea. Like, what <laughs> do you? Like, does it throw you from being able to sit down and write? Like, I, you know, I'm just wondering if if you can just sort of do it no matter what's going on around you? Um, not no matter what. Uh, there's, well, our house is full of distractions, obviously, with, you know, ten pets, <laughs> uh, two kids, and a wife, of course. There's a lot of distractions here. But um, the only things that really get in the way are, like, those really heavy life situations where uh, someone's sick or there's a family <clears throat> issue going on. But otherwise, I can usually write through almost anything. When we talk to uh, Mick... What's your situation? What's your process? How does how does Mick write about the dick? <laughs> At night under a blanket. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, yeah, it yeah. works. No, I I usually actually I work nights, and so mornings uh, are kind of my time, and it just depends on what I have going on. Unfortunately, I don't have nearly the time I'd like to write, but usually in the mornings, as soon as you know things that need to be taken care of are I can sit down and just get as much as I can done before I have to get ready to go to work. It used to be like I'd have to have like the right mood or just if I didn't have anything in mind, forget it. But I've kind of conditioned myself and added a little more discipline, I guess, to where if I just start writing words, it kickstarts everything and then I'm off to the races. So the the moods are not as as important as they were, or the distractions, I guess, don't. Um, not as much. Uh, I think that was you know kind of the disciplinary thing is like if I'm going to actually get anything productive done, I've got to just be able to focus and stick with it. And since doing that, uh, not only has my output been better, but more stuff that I actually like because I'm getting more into my process. And not allowing my stupid brain to just oh hey look at that look something shiny. Well, how do you how do you uh, experience your characters? Uh, do you do you have an inner monologue in your head to uh, to create dialogue or you know do, do you hear voices? <laughs> <laughs> no, the medication takes care of that. Um, <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> no, I, I uh, my characters tend to be tend to create themselves in a lot of cases, or they're situationally driven, and. I just kind of let them do their thing. My my style tends to be kind of convers. My style of writing, I guess, tends to be a little conversationally driven. And I know, like, I'm pretty dialogue he dialogue heavy. And so I just kind of let them wander around and do their thing, and you know, follow them around and go with that. How about you, James? Do you, do you hear voices too? Or? Uh, well, in, in that sense, yes. <laughs> I do. Uh, my characters live in my head until the story is through. Um, so I kind of think the way they do until it's over. I guess it would be like a, like almost like method acting for a writer. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's not healthy. It, 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 does it help? <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say you probably drive and you're hearing these voices. <laughs> do they tell you to go places that you don't really plan on going and you find yourself in a location that you didn't know existed oh no no that's just when i sit down and um kind of lay out the scene rather than act it out you don't wake up with blood on your hands not yet and i really <laughs> hope that doesn't happen you know muddy shoes and a shovel by the bed <laughs> i would not tell if i did yeah see, he was all you notice he didn't respond right away there because yeah, exactly. it's incriminating God, they know. it's incriminating do they know did they see it i don't know <laughs> we're not going to tell anyone yeah Nobody will know. Deny, really. deny, deny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I take the fifth. What are your influences? And we, let's start with Mick. What what influences you to, to to write? It doesn't have to be other writers, of course. It can be uh, music or you know, uh, bathhouse, whatever. <laughs> well, no, bathhouse is not for a long time. But no, um, it, it depends. Like 
I'm pretty musically driven in a lot of aspects of my life, and so there's been a lot of times that either I'll hear a piece of music or like certain string of of the lyrics kickstart something in my head and the story will form. Uh, other times I'll see um, just kind of everyday life, you know, like most writers, I'm a habitual people watcher. Mm-hmm. And so I, I observe things going on, seeing people interact, and my brain just starts spinning and taking it from there and constructing different things. Uh, and lately, well, I don't know about lately, but uh, last couple of years, one thing that's been kind of a, a stockpile of different ideas to kind of go back to is I listen to a lot of the old time radio shows, especially like suspense and inner sanctum and stuff like that. And a lot of those shows, I mean, there are a lot of them are really good and they have these really great story ideas and I'll take the, those ideas, run with them in my head until it just kind of morphs into something completely different. But a lot of times I'll use that if nothing else and just, writing exercises you know it may not be something published but it's you know something fun to do and just helps me become better at storytelling yeah yeah those are the best the best ones that's all i listen to at night all alone nice me and my dog (laughs) (laughs) and and james so so what what's your situation like like who what are your influences oh wow um well like mick Music's pretty huge, but it varies from story to story. Um, for example, the story I'm writing now um, with the dark, dark fiction, that is mostly classical music with um, an anthology story I have coming up. It's, I'm listening to old horror scores from like 80s movies. Um, sometimes I'll listen to just chaotic jazz. It, it depends on the story, whatever it calls for. Also, um, I'm just big on my own life experiences and also people watching. Uh, that's, to, I guess every writer probably does that. You have to have a basic understanding of humanity. Otherwise you're not going to represent them very well. People watching. So that, does that mean like you go to a coffee shop and you watch people and then you kind of take them? So uh, it, it, do you ever use people, you know, um, loosely, Never, never in a way that's recognizable to that person. No, uh, maybe a mannerism or a profession, uh, things like that. Never anything very specific that they would yeah, recognize. Yeah, whenever whenever an author says that, I know what they mean. <laughs> you just don't want to say who it is, but they think that's someone. right away they thought of someone, and they're like, ah, yeah, you know. But then they don't want to say it. I have a respect know. for all my subjects. That's all I'll say. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Nick, who 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 is the Dick Wiggler? The Dick Wiggler, well, Dick Wiggler, his name is Monty. And poor Monty, he's just embarrassed with life in general and just trying to get through, except he's got that one that one ability. Uh, he's not really based off of anybody, really. I, I guess in some aspects, well, I think all writers have a little piece of themselves and in, in their characters. And, you know, those, those times in life when I'm a little insecure, that's probably what got downloaded in the into the main character of that one. What part of the Dick Wiggler was it? <laughs> Good question. That was too easy. That was too easy. <laughs> you know, it's the wiggling yeah. part. It's a, yeah, it's a little dick in all of us. Yeah. Well. well. <laughs> oh. I mean, not at the oh. moment, but. <laughs> We're all that guy. Beep. <laughs> yeah, that's like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, rude. <laughs> all right. The people around. I'm blaming here. you, Al. Yeah, the people around. I was around. sweet and innocent yeah. before I got on the show. <laughs> yeah, I break them in. Break them in hard. <laughs> yeah. Favorite favorite author? Who's your favorite author? So what? Let's let's start with James on that. Ooh. I guess it depends on the genre. Um, I'd say with horror, hands down, Clive Barker. He's been my favorite for forever. Um, with fantasy, probably. You know, I, I like Tolkien and all those guys, but I really like what Neil Gaiman does. He's awesome. Um, I really like the Bizarro scene right now with people like Danger Slater, um, Kevin Donahue, John Bassoff, people like that. But I, I came up on stuff, mostly Beat Generation and Lost Generation authors. I loved um, Burroughs, loved him. Um, Kerouac, hmm. all those guys. 
And of course, you have all my books. Oh, naturally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and Mick, what what are you? Who are your favorite authors? Um, you know, favorites. It's one of those questions that as soon as anyone asks, my brain goes completely blank. Uh, but I do have to. Uh, my answer is. Uh, Mir James quite a bit. It's probably one of the reasons we get along so well. Barker, probably one of my biggest influences and probably the one I, I can go back and reread every single time. Um, also in the horror, I got to say uh, another big influence and another one I could probably reread at the drop of a hat. It's Poppy Bright. Mm. I just love, I mean, I used to, to joke that Poppy's uh, books turned me both uh, goth and gay. So we have that. <laughs> um, but, like, on the non-horror side, I'm a huge Kurt Vonnegut fan. Um, usually every few years i got to kind of go back and, if not reread, just kind of skim through. But um, I kind of just read a little bit of everything. Neil Gaiman's another one that I absolutely love. But then I'll venture out and read some, like, uh, G.K. Chesterton or... I read a lot of also uh, old Victorian ghost stories. So Le Fanu, Sheridan Le Fanu is another one that I love going back to all the time. Yeah. And, and you've got quite a few of my books too. Oh, of course. I got a whole shelf. I got a whole shelf. <laughs> Boy, people don't even get that. You know, you're on my show. <laughs> <laughs> the least you can do is say, yeah. yeah. I tell you, people are just being mean. Um, okay, so let's see. Now, you guys like social media. Do you guys like to interact with listeners or readers or uh, things like that? And where is it that people find you? James. Oh, wow. Uh, well, Gloomhouse and also me just as an author, James G. Carlson, um, all over social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, even on uh, that new app, Slasher. But I haven't used that in a while. But um, – also, a wet, we have a website for Gloomhouse, uh, gloomhousepublishing.wordpress.com. You can find our releases there and our social media links, things like that. Hmm. And Slasher, what, the, what, is, what is that? It's, a, it's an app, social media app that was – it's for horror fans, but it's not really taking off the way I'd hoped it would. Um, it's, it's still pretty cool, though. So I, I log in occasionally and check it out. Oh. And and um, so, Mick, what about you? Where where do people find you? Uh, I'm on Facebook probably more than anything. Uh, and I'm also – I have my own, my own website, michaelrcollins.wordpress.com, where – I mean, that's got all the info for my books, both uh, under Mick Collins and my horror works under Michael R. Collins. But I'm on Facebook a lot. I'm on Instagram. I just started having some fun on TikTok. At Mick writes, so I'm I'm not too hard to find. Okay, a grinder. Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. I'm married, <laughs> so I laid off on that. Oh well, <laughs> give it a year. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, we'll have all that up on the website. People can find you with one click, and they'll they'll get at it and and uh, send you messages. Please, do you guys do, do bad reviews bother either one of you? Not I'd be lying as, if I said no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, no. Not as much as they used to, but they still can, like, you know. I got a one-star review uh, just for someone who decided it wasn't their cup of tea, and, you know, I obsessed about it for about 30 minutes and then slowly started getting over it. Yeah. Well, you just hunt them down and kill them. Yeah. Well, I didn't say how I got over it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, 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 of course, James, you don't get any bad ones, do you? I've had uh, some less than desirable ones. Uh, I had one that stays with me that the person said they simply, they found my writing boring and they just couldn't get interested, interested in the story and just didn't finish it. Uh, that's the worst one I've ever had. And I think it was a, a like a two star, maybe I forget, but um, that, yes, yeah, that stuff stays with you because that, that book um, it's called the ever descending staircase it's just reprints of my earliest anthology stories that I submitted. And um, once I got the rights back to them and it's still one of my more popular books, but occasionally someone, you know, doesn't like it. Yeah. You're always going to get that, but right. You know, there's always going to be a, 
a certain amount of someone that that doesn't like. Um, do you ever get? Do you ever look at them and kind of try to figure out what it was that? Do you look at them to try and make yourself better? I guess that would be it. Absolutely. Yeah, I take oh, yeah. reviews as a challenge. Absolutely. Yeah, to do better. <laughs> Yeah, I've learned a lot from some less than stellar reviews because uh, sometimes they have little nuggets in there that it's like, okay, I need to do better. How can I do it? Now, obviously, some of them are just people who are never satisfied, and that's fine. But you can learn a lot from a bad review if you give yourself mm-hmm. a chance. That's true. Yeah. You could always write a, a new follow-up called the, the Nugget Wiggler. <laughs> See, there we go. I like okay, it. This could this could be a whole series. The Wiggler. You can wiggle all sorts of stuff. It'll be great. <laughs> yeah, you can have the Wiggler series, book, book eighteen. I would read that. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's like Jason, book eighteen. Wiggler Never takes ends. Manhattan. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, even <laughs> Stephen King gets bad reviews. So. Yeah, true. Yeah, you know, yeah, you're always going to have that, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll get them side by side. I'll get someone say it's you know four star, great. Next one, they have a one star. This guy can't write, yeah. and they're both right. <laughs> well, talking about James's book, The Ever Descending Staircase, I was recently uh, holding down the table at a vending event for Gloomhouse Books, and we, ha- we there was one lady who came, pointed at The Ever Descending sc- Staircase specifically, and told me that that was one of her favorite books. So stuff like that is that helps dispel that those bad reviews. That's true. Did she have three three eyes and one arm. That, not that I could see, but I wasn't paying attention. How is the COVID for your writing? Let's start with James. Did it does, does things like COVID and and the stress of all that stuff going on outside your door get interfere or make your writing darker? Do you think? I think during that time uh, of the lockdown, absolutely. I got COVID very early on, and so I was not only in lockdown, I was also very sick. Even so, I sat down and wrote. And that's when I wrote my novella, um, Midnight in the City of the Carrion Kid, and which is up for a Splatterpunk Award this year. But um, it's a pretty dark story, and it's pretty personal. It just seemed like the right time to write it because it was a very dark and depressing time during lockdown. It was, it was a struggle for everybody. And, Mick, of course, well, it was different for you? Yeah, I uh... – COVID or the whole lockdown and pandemic, my creativity took a severe nosedive. I struggled creatively with it. I didn't get sick. Um, I worked, actually, I was working overtime the, the entire time, and maybe that had something to do with it. But I really struggled during that time to put out anything that was any good at all. I, I, I think I put out only two two things that, well, at all. One was a short story, and uh, the other one was a Vero Malum, which is what uh, James published through Gloomhouse for me. And that was it. And it was actually because of James taking a chance on that book that really re sparked and reignited me as a writer, wanting to be a writer and really be with the writing community more than I had been in the past because I just, I got really inspired. That's actually where Dick Wiggler came from. I just, that published and I was like, all right, you know what? We're doing this. That was an inspiration um, for Dick Wiggler. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's like- it's an inspired story, really. <laughs> okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and listen to this and see how many times you say Dick Wiggler, because that's just, it's making me laugh every time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a drinking game. Yeah, there we yeah. go. This is the, the drinking oh, yeah. game. We, we should have yeah, done that. Right? That's so many shots. I don't, <laughs> I don't know where I am anymore. This one's taking a weird turn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a normal turn for me. <laughs> What will be next for Mick after this? Are you going to do a follow-up to Dick? Um, I'm thinking about it. I just really don't have any anything concrete um, for as far as a solid storyline, but I'd like to. Um, of course, I say that with every book. I'd like to follow it up, but it never happens. But I think right now I'm just going to hunker down. I'm going to work on some short stories, and I've got a few novel ideas I want to kick around. But I'm just trying to push myself and, and – do different ideas, different things, try different techniques, and go from there. I know uh, I have. We're going to have a 
an, a collection of stories out later this year uh, through Bloom House that I'll be a part of. But that's about all I've got on the burner at the moment. And short stories, do you like those better? It kind of goes back and forth. Sometimes I really like just telling a nice, short, concise story, and other times I just like spreading out and and seeing how far I can go and writing a nice, nice thick novel. Yeah, yeah, I like spreading out. Um, <laughs> J- James, short, short, short stories, or are you into more of a full story? What, what's your favorite? I say novellas are my favorite. Um, but sto- short stories are my first love because that's how I started writing horror. And um, I find them, they're easier to write for me. They're less of a challenge. But the novella has become my, my favorite, definitely. Well, I'm wondering, you know, mentioning horror and stuff, uh, horror fiction as a category kind of, you know, imploded a bit in the 80s, early 90s. Mm. Do, do you think, and this is for both of you, do you think uh, there's been a resurgence of, of horror lately? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And all flavors of horror have really, I think, started to come into their own again. And I'm here for it because there's some really good stuff coming out. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree. The horror community is huge and um, probably the most accepting and most wonderful people I've met uh, in the literary world are from the horror community. It's, oh, it's a yeah. great place to be. That's true. Animals. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Ah, so here we go. So that's 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 how it goes. And uh Another another great day here. So now the books we we need you to go out and help support these uh, young uh, authors here. You know uh, we've got Mr. James G. Carlson who's got Hacked in Two. You know it's a must read, and we got uh, Mr. Mick Collins who's got the Dick Wiggler and other useless superpowers. And that's the name of this book, not him. Um, but wow. they're both available. <laughs> both of them will be up on the website. Uh, help them out. You know we've got uh, you know. Got a little bit of uh, work here to be doing. So, again, thank you guys for being on the show. Well, thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. 